everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you guys are enjoying Waste Expo so far. So this session is our Nothing Wasted Talk session, which is Waste, es Waste Expo's take on TED Talks. So Nothing Wasted Talks is a new series that we're introducing this year at Waste Expo. And through this open forum, we will provide short enlightening talks on a wide array of topics from industry thought leaders and visionaries. <laughs> So my name is Mallory Schapansky. I'm the editorial director for Waste 360 and the moderator for today's session. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Eric Randall is the director of recycling for Bryson Recycling. He's a serial social entrepreneur who started his career in recycling in 1989. And since 1992, he has led the development of social enterprise Bryson Recycling which is now the leading provider of household recycling services in Northern Ireland. And J.D. Lindeberg, who is the president and principal of RRS. J.D. has designed and developed MRFs, been closely engaged in recovery technology development and transfer, and he's worked hard to maximize recovery and minimize cost in the recycling industry. His knowledge in waste recovery systems, capital project planning, Design engineering, organics, and greenhousing projects are leveraged by many private and public sectors. Le Lisa Von Strumer is the founder and CEO of Growing City. Lisa is an award-winning entrepreneur who, pri who pioneered an entirely new service sector in the waste industry. Her company, Growing City, was the first in North America to offer concierge corporate organics recycling programs. And driven by a desire to create a profitable business that positively impacted the environment, Lisa has led Growing City to double-digit annual growth for the past five years. And last but not least, Monica Wilson, Associate Director for Gaia US. Monica has played roles in the global team since 2002. She serves on the board of Zero Waste USA, and she was named the California Resource Recovery Association 2002 Recycler of the Year. So I'd like you all to welcome our panelists. Now Monica's gonna kick it off. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. I think you've probably all seen the news about plastic pollution in the ocean. You might have even heard a story that countries like Indonesia or Philippines are the source of that waste. And as representatives of the recycling community, I want you to hold that idea with a giant grain of salt and think about that story, that question throughout my presentation. This is the tale of two sides of the plastic waste crisis and the plastic pollution crisis. First, we'll look at a city that has brought zero waste citywide in the Philippines that is succeeding, is doing an amazing job, and is giving us an inspiration for waste reduction as a focus. And next, we'll take a hard look at US recycling that's ending up in other countries right now. And in these changing times, look at how in the US we can be making changes to, um, to really meet the, the purpose that we're all doing this work for. So in cities all around the world that are focused on setting up new or expanding waste collection systems, they face two pretty big choices. That's a choice between a linear waste management focused system where cities invest and are stuck with debt for ex ever expanding landfills, stuck with incinerators that then catch them into contracts where they have to keep generating waste. These are really capital intensive projects and for many parts of the world, it's not a realistic financial approach. What I wanna share today is a zero waste approach that is successful, that is working in the Philippines and is building out in many other cities in Southeast Asia. This is a decentralized system, and that is important because local government in these parts of the world is often decentralized. So it's building on existing local government structures. That gives us an opportunity for decentralized composting, and when compost is half of your waste stream, you can automatically see how that is a big benefit. It gives an opportunity for better recycling and for more jobs creation from waste pickers who used to pick across in the community at will, but now can be given jobs and, and serve and work for the community with a long-term career in waste work. It also, in these zero waste systems, there's a huge priority on identifying what's left. And we're gonna really dig into what that means and why that's so important for waste reduction. So let's go visit the city of Tacloban in the Philippines. 
Tacloban is a major city in a region of the Philippines called the Eastern Visayas. And this is, um, you know, the Philippines is made up of lots and lots and lots of islands, so Tacloban is right on the coast. You might have heard about Tacloban a few years ago when it was hit in 2013 with a massive typhoon. It made news here for days. It was called Haiyan. The city was devastated. The infrastructure was devastated. And so all of that was part of motivating the city to embrace a really uh, fundamental zero waste approach. So in 2013, this city, which has about a quarter of a million residents, started working with Mother Earth Foundation. Mother Earth Foundation has worked with cities across the Philippines to do this very model. And what you're seeing here is a delegation out into the community. This is what education and outreach around source separation looks like. It's a team of folks going door to door, speaking to people one on one, and making sure they understand what source separation means. So note the tricycle. Note the cart that connects to the tricycle. This is what it takes, okay? We're gonna come back to that cart, so hold that in your mind. Okay, let's look at this just from a waste collection system, all right, from just as that, if that was our only metric. In six months, the city of Tacloban went from waste collection in 30% of the city, because that's all they could afford in the city's budget, to waste collection in 100% of the city. And that's, that's tremendous, right? From a plastic pollution perspective, from a containment perspective, that's tremendous. But that's not enough. Now imagine if Tacloban had adopted a very, you know, that first model I talked about, that very linear, landfill focused, we're mostly talking about disposal focus. Imagine if they'd done that. You can already see that landfill would be in trouble soon, right? Because the waste going to the landfill just went up a ton if they had done that. But they didn't. So what Tacloban did is with source separation, they actually reduced waste to the landfill while improving collection massively. I mean, that sounds so like, like it, it sounds impossible, but it's not. If you imagine that half of the waste stream is organic, and when you've got decentralized composting, you can tackle that fast, and that's what happened. So even before the full source separation program has spread out across the city, landfill waste is going down with full waste collection, Waste entering the open environment is going down dramatically, right? And that's a metric a lot of people are caring about. The amount of composted and recycled waste, that's over here, this last circle, that is just growing up a storm. And it's gonna grow further as source separation spreads. So that is the power of a zero waste approach. The whole idea that we have to be focused on landfill, 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 or incinerator, incinerator disposal, it throws it out the door, right? So this is what the system looks like the flow chart of materials. I think a lot of you probably care about flow charts and where does the stuff go and what is the cycle. So food scraps, that's the biggest one, like I mentioned. Those carts that are going along with the tricycles, the biggest container is for food scraps. At each resident, at each uh, household, those are kept separate. The food scraps are contained. Recyclables are contained separately. And then everything that's left over ends up in the container that does go to the landfill. But then what happens to that trash these little dotted lines, is that Tacloban and other cities who have adopted a zero waste approach in the Philippines study the waste. We're, in the next slide, we're gonna to get to what that means. They study what's in it, and they use that data to build new policies, to build new practices, to talk and give feedback to the brands that are making products. So Mother Earth Foundation and Gaia Philippines, which is our organization's office in the Philippines, which. Um, works with organizations all across Asia Pacific. They have been doing so many of these waste assessment brand audits, which is kind of like a waste characterization on steroids. It's like super detailed, so many categories. They've done so many that they were able to pull together waste audits from over 13 cities in the Philippines. This is groundbreaking data. I don't know if you've ever tried to figure out what's in the waste stream in other countries around the world. It's not so easy. And so now we have really verified, detailed data about what is in the waste stream. And we know what's in, where the, the waste is coming from. So for example, sachets. Sachets are the growing focus of single-use packaging for brands in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and in other countries in the region. Um, you know, you go and you sit and you watch television and commercial after commercial, you can buy your laundry detergent now in sachet. You can buy your toothpaste, your toilet bowl cleaner now in sachet. That's the selling point. That is the push, push, push from brands to the public. And that means now there are almost 60 billion pieces of sachets being wasted every year in the Philippines. And now I want you to put on your recycler hat. 
okay, I think you might be able to feel the frustration that cities feel right now when they're told, oh, it's your problem, plastic pollution was caused by you. And they're saying, wait a minute, we didn't make that decision. We weren't in the boardroom when Nestle and Unilever and Procter and Gamble and Coke decided to move towards packaging that has no fate in the recycling system. They cannot be reused, right? So that's the perspective that cities are bringing to this story now. And the brands are feeling it. I don't know if you're following this in social media or in the news, brands are really feeling the heat right now and we need to keep up the pressure. And it's up to brands to set new systems in place, to figure out new ways of packaging, to figure out new ways of distributing stuff so that we don't need as much single-use packaging, much less little tiny uh, wasteful containers of it. So I think it's at this point that we had to kind of have to switch context a little bit. I want to step away from the Philippines and think about the situation we're sitting in here in the US. You know, for years we have been told by brands, we have been told by the packaging and the plastic industry, collect more plastic, recycle more, recycle more plastic. Collect it, collect it. But now in this moment when waste exports are shifting from country to country, now we don't know where it's ending up, right? And that's becoming a really big problem for the US recycling industry. And now it's the US recycling industry that is feeling, I think, a heat that you might compare to what's being felt in other countries around the world right now. Because the decisions about the plastic waste that's ending up in Indonesia that we exported were not made by those of us in this room. They were made in the boardrooms of the companies making the materials or selling the products, right? So because Gaia is a global network, uh, we've been following waste trade issues quite a lot over the past few years. Our members in Indonesia and Malaysia have been sending up alarm bells saying, we are seeing this more and more. We're really concerned. We know this is coming from the US. US, can you document it? So we did. I invite you to go to wastetradestories.org and there we've documented a lot of stories from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from Thailand, following the trace of materials from the US. Um, or at least being able to figure out where it ended up because it's really hard to follow, okay? That's, that's entirely the point. So this is a village in Indonesia called North Sumengo. or North Sumengo. And a year ago, North Sumengo was a agricultural village of rice and corn fields. And now this is plastic waste that contaminated paper bales that was shipped out from the US and Europe for recycling at a paper mill miles away from this location. The paper mill doesn't want it, so they separated it out, they put it on a truck, and it ends up in many different villages. And North Sumengo is one of them. Um, we documented the same thing happening in Malaysia, in Thailand. This is a, it's a growing problem because of the shifting, um, the shifting you know, markets that are happening right now. And because we can't trace, we don't know where this is going. Now countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, I think we probably all read, they're, they're erecting barriers now, they're saying, wait, we want the right to refuse this material. We want to have a say in what comes into our border. We didn't make this stuff, it's not ours. And um, that's an issue that's being debated right now at the UN. The UN Basel Convention talks are happening this week. I've been getting reports on my phone all day because we have a team there along with our members from all over the region. And at that convention where they talk about waste trade, actually toxic waste trade, they're considering adding plastic waste to the list of materials that must be notified, where we need disclosure and transparency. And that also would allow governments to say, we actually don't want this material anymore. We want to have a say in what comes across our border. What the recycling industry does in the US in this moment will define it for years to come. I think we're really at a crossing point. We're, we're at a crossroads of what we do. Right? We didn't choose to, we didn't intend to send piles of plastic waste to Indonesia or other countries. That was not our intent, and yet that is what is happening. And at the same time, I know many of you came here to a session like this because you care about resource conservation and you care about succeeding in recycling and waste prevention. So there are things we can do. When it comes to the plastic waste trade itself, we can disclose end markets, we can end exports, we can support things like recycled content mandates and other ways of building a stronger infrastructure here in the United States for materials instead of exporting it, right? So there's that set of things that we can do. And that's where the US recycling industry, I know, 
is stepping up in ways, and I think it needs to step up more. I think that is, our, that is the promise that we need to deliver, right, to, to put forward our best role in this situation. But you also have a really unique role for waste reduction. I mean, there is nobody like talking to a recycler to say, is this thing really recyclable? Because you guys know, right? That is a powerful set of information. And speaking to brands to say to them, if it's not recycled, then it's not recyclable. Giving them that type of feedback, making it clear to brands what is actually gonna work and what is not gonna work. That is a role of, of the US recycling industry, I would argue. We also have way too much plastic in the system. So I would also argue that to fix recycling in the US, we need to get out the junk plastic. And that is where I would call on the US recycling industry to support reduction of, um, of waste generation overall. There are lots of measures being discussed in state capitals across the US. And I think it's actually an exciting opportunity for the recycling world to speak up and say, yes, we need less single-use plastic so that we can get our job done because otherwise it's contaminating and messing up the things that we are trying to do. So there are a few really great examples I've seen recently of how the recycling industry is already doing this. Um, and I think they're really important examples to follow. The first is National Recycling Coalition. They have a clear statement that energy recovery for plastic waste is not recycling. And that's actually a message that brands need to hear. That's the type of feedback we need to be giving to brands being really clear that when you take plastic and make plastic to fuel, that's not recycling. When you send plastic to cement kilns, that is not recycling. Let's be really clear about the waste hierarchy, right? So that's a really great service that the recycling industry can provide. Another completely different example is an opinion piece that ran in the San Francisco Chronicle a few months ago. It was by Mike Sangiacomo, the CEO of Recology, and it was titled, It's Time to Cut Use of Plastics. Right, that's a pretty straightforward message. And he outlined the ways that plastics are causing problems for recycling, and he outlined expectations from the plastic industry. Those are the types of examples that I need to, we need to see more and more of, and we think the recycling community is in a great position to do that. And I would also encourage you to follow the example of mission-based nonprofit recyclers like Eureka Recycling, like EcoCycle, like Ecology Center Ann Arbor and Ecology Center Berkeley, who have really found a way to balance profit and success in recycling with advocacy for waste reduction. Because I think that's the direction we all need to go to as a recycling industry in the United States. On the other hand, you can probably imagine there's another shoe to drop here. There are far too many examples of the waste industry entrenching existing old infrastructure, which just enables more plastic production. So I wanna give you an example that, that pains me, um, which is that last week, National Waste and Recycling Association sued the city of Baltimore because the city of Baltimore passed a law to reduce pollution from their largest industrial emitter in the city, which is their waste incinerator. And I really don't think that's the image that recycling and the waste industry wants to put out in the world right now, trying to bolster up these old technologies that need to be closed down, right? That's not what we need to be, what, what I would encourage the industry to support. Instead, I really want, I, I think it's time for a serious, clear focus on waste reduction and making recycling actually succeed domestically here in the United States. And it's really remarkable the way that attention and the focus on the crisis of single-use plastics has grown in the last few years. It's a remarkable moment. And that crisis is an important opportunity because it's in crisis that we have the biggest opportunities to make significant shifts. So I hope we can follow the example of cities like Tacloban in the Philippines where they are pursuing zero waste, succeeding, and showing what needs to change. Thank you very much. Well, I can tell you that's actually saved me um, a few points that I was gonna make about um, recycling and the responsibility that we have uh, when we're considering how recycling systems are actually set up because we've been driven by um, two things. One is the environmental outcomes and the other one is the social and, well, the, the economic outcomes of recycling. So I have flown across halfway around the world to come and speak to you for 15 minutes about some of the work that we've been doing in Northern Ireland. Um, delighted to have the opportunity. 
Uh, what I'm going to be showing you is going to appear at first as kind of left field. And I want to say health warning at the beginning. I don't expect that what we've done in Northern Ireland is a cut and paste straight into the States, but I do believe the principles that we have learned and applied are applicable. So I work for Bryson Charitable Group, or Bryson Recycling, which is part of Bryson Charitable Group. It employs about a thousand people. It's, um, it's a social enterprise. Um, but on the recycling side, we actually handle 60% of the recyclables collected from households in Northern Ireland. So we have a sizable market share. And being a social enterprise gives us the opportunity to apply our principles to business first. We need to make a profit. <coughs> but we also are fundamentally interested in the outcomes. And the outcomes are what gives the best environmental and social and economic results for Northern Ireland and the world generally by dealing with this problem. The waste problem is also an opportunity. So let's really understand it from, from that perspective. So Brighton Recycling, we have uh, around 280 staff. We have 10 depots across Republic Island, um, North Wales, but mostly our operations are in Northern Ireland. Um, we turn over, it's actually closer to 15 million at this point in time. And we're also, um, not publicly yet, but we're about to purchase a plastic sorting plant um, 10 miles down the road to ensure that all the plastics that we collect are reprocessed within the UK or Ireland. Okay, so this is a bit of a personal story for me. You may recognize this person. Back in 1992, I joined Bryson. Um, uh, I was on a government training program. I was the only person involved in recycling at that point. Um, and we started off by running the Cash for Cans program, which I believe was prevalent in the States. Is it still a thing? Does it still happen? Yeah, okay. We're still doing it as well, by the way, but we have kind of moved on. In the early 2000s, we could see coming over the horizon European directives that were going to require countries to collect um, recyclables from the curbside and actually named four materials. It also said they had to be collected separately. Interestingly, the industry has largely ignored that in the UK, and the predominant approach is a single stream approach. These are electric vehicles, by the way. Um, that didn't really work. The electric vehicle market has improved significantly. I'd quite like to go back to this idea, but we fundamentally found that driving, uh, when you drive a milk float and deliver milk to households, the vehicle gets lighter and lighter as you go on. When you do recycling, it does the opposite. It gets heavier and heavier, and it grinds almost to a stop with queues of traffic cars behind it. But look, th the point of this is that we trialed door-to-door -door collections of recyclables to 8,000 households, and we used the data. We really got deep into the data. Similar thing. So we were actually working out how much paper, how much glass, how much plastics, etc., were actually being produced by different socioeconomic types of housing. So we could plan and route rounds. And off the back of that, we won every contract that came out in Northern Ireland for about an 18-month period and went from, I think, about uh, 10 people to 200 people overnight. Um, one of those contracts actually was a regional MRF. So we have also significant experience and have been running that since 2005. It's a single stream MRF, less glass. This vehicle we call the Ford Model T. It's not the vehicle that I want to talk to you about, which is um, a significant, significant improvement on this, but it's an example of the type of vehicle that the community sector was operating with, um, typically in the kind of 90s, 2000s. Um, the system being the households were given boxes and that we sorted into different, cat different categories of materials onto the vehicles um, as, as we were going along. Um, that's our MRF operation. It's handling around 35,000 tons a year. So a, a sizable enough operation. So after a few years of operating this, we were getting really interested in where we saw the future potentially lying and where it was best to invest in. The MRF, 
at that point, um, on a daily basis, we were struggling with quality. We only have 10% contamination coming into the plant. Um, we don't have any glass, but still achieving the standards of getting materials to the market has been the constant concern all the way through. And then we faced the Chinese saw just in the same way as everybody else did. And our response to that was actually to slow the plant right down, halve the throughput, and we are selling the paper into a UK mill, but at an enormous cost, which had to be borne by the uh, local authority. On the flip side of that, the collection scheme using this, um, the hardware was the problem. The boxes tend to get blown away, lids came off, um, people didn't like manually handling them, the vehicles were quite slow and cumbersome to use. And we wanted to really redesign the way we do recycling. And our starting point was to say that we have to collect in a way that delivers materials to the specification of local buyers. The concept local circular economy is very important. And I think that the supply chain generally within this industry is broken. Uh, I was observing that there's, I haven't actually come across a single materials, what we call reprocessor or recycler at this conference. Um, there's not enough talking. So we set about talking to the end users of the materials and we designed our collection system around not only what their specifications were, but we built vehicles and containers that were very specific in terms of the amount of space that we actually needed for each material because we live in the real world and we have to develop a system that's economically efficient, that's productive, and that's safe and delivers high quality materials. So those were our criteria. So these were some of the vehicles that were kind of out there, right the way from a horse and cart through to electric vehicles to a lot of things that looked like they were kind of made in the backyard um, with stillages and so on. In the States and Canada, um, similar vehicles out there. Uh, we tried, the one in the middle has the kind of the, the trough that lifts up and tips into different containers. We tried one of those. It was a 26 ton vehicle. It was a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And the challenge that we were dealing with is that the councils wanted us to collect more and more. So they wanted us to collect the plastics and the cardboard, which were both growing in tonnage. So how do you do that on a stillage-based vehicle? Um, I'll start on the, the innovation that we have on the, on the boxes. These are two, I'm sorry, I work in liters rather than gallons. I really struggle to convert, but fit two 55 liter boxes uh, in which people were asked to put some materials in one and some materials in the other. I've already said, now th those are kind of what were being used in Canada in the 70s, and no one has redesigned them to say, let's actually design a container that's there for recycling. So we came up with this, which is three boxes stacked on top of each other, each with a point of entry. So the top one has um, a lid, which is hinged, and the bottom two have posted points. It's all framed around um, a trolley, so the householder can move it, so it acts like um, a wheelie bin. It's very easy for householders to use. We have printed on the side the materials that can, people can actually collect. Um, and what we find is people use it very well. They separate the materials out. So effectively, the householders are being the sorters for us. They're our MRF. One of the advantages is that if they get it wrong, we simply give the material back to them in the box with notes saying, sorry, we don't take nappies ever, thank you. Um, in the MRF, we get about a quarter of a ton of nappies every day. So we, that it just doesn't happen in this system. Um, we group the materials together so that's, a, that's, so that's efficient. The top box has paper and then some fringe items such as um, batteries, foil, and old hand tools, believe it or not, which actually get sent off to West Africa to tradesmen who use them for their livelihood. The middle box is plastic bottles, cans, and cartons. They don't need to be sorted at all. They just go into one compartment on the vehicle. 
and the bottom box does require some sorting, it's glass and cardboard. So that's our, um, our DeLorean Back to the Future vehicle and it, it doesn't really do it any justice just seeing that picture so I'm going to walk you through the vehicle and show you little video sh snatches of it actually being used. So it's, there are a number of, number of different compartments. Um, the front one is for the plastics to cancel, the, the, the middle box, the containers, less glass, go into that and there's a ram that actually, uh, a lift that lifts the materials up and then the whole top deck of that it stores the lightweight materials because that's the best place to put it. Um, so this is the thing in, a, in action. Our guys are brilliant. They can work really fast and slow motion at the same time. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is back at the depot. The door opens at the back and you can just see good clean material coming out and that's, that's probably about half a day's worth of collections at that point. We can work with that. That runs across a line with an eddy current, um, an overhead magnet and then an optical sorter and we have clean material involving two people just on that sorting process. In the middle end we have um, paper. Goes back, the doors open, the floor goes into a pyramid shape and the material just flows out either side. Food waste is also collected at the same time. We have a separate small caddy that the people put out alongside the, 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 the wheelie box. Um, this is the only one that actually involves any kind of forklift activity. That's the guys actually just tipping in. Food waste is great to collect as a material on because it's very dense um, and it's very quick and easy to, uh, to take off. So that's the container being tipped with a, a rotating head into, and I believe you call it a roll box. Is that right? A roll on box? Okay, we call it a roll, roll, roll on, roll off, but anyway, <laughs> potatoes, potatoes, and all that. Um, then we have glass at the back. Actually, this is quite a, one of an older design vehicle. We've been operating these vehicles since 2012. And then at the very back, we have cardboard, which is compacted. Um, there's a compaction plate at the top, which comes down. Um, we bring it back to the, this is rather neat. Yeah. So the whole, the whole vehicle, uh, we, there's now about 600 of these on the road. We actually collaborated with a company in Ireland who set up a production facility. You cannot get them for love and money at the moment. They're building four a week. Um, their order book goes back six months. They are replacing um, the older types of vehicles that are on the marketplace. And as a result, this system as a whole is now forming the basis of policy. It has formed the basis of policy in Wales. Um, we worked with the Welsh Government to bring both of these products in. Um, and the Welsh Government, you may, may be aware, is now at, I think, second or third best in the world in terms of recycling rates. And it's all based on this system. We collect high quality materials and we uh, sell them locally into the marketplace. So you may look at that and think, well, that's got to be really expensive as far as the kind of collection system is concerned. If you look at the whole picture, it's not. It, we have not just us compared this, but the regional governments in the UK have looked at these different models. They looked at dual stream, single stream, this approach, and about half a dozen others. And this comes out on top in terms of both cost and the ability to recycle. And the reason is because you're collecting so many materials in one pass, Although the collection element does cost more than a refuse collection vehicle system, the MRF cost is virtually non-existent. And you've got materials that can be sold at a very high price and you don't have the fluctuating issues because you're selling them into local markets. I'm going to make you any MRF operators here, I know there's one at least, okay, paper we're selling at approximately $130 a tonne. Glass we're selling at about $40 a tonne. Um, Version. So, in each of the materials, I think we have a, a blended basket price of just under 100 pounds a ton. And when you add all those things up together, the economics means this actually works better. Um, there's an interesting side effect as well. I mentioned about us being able to educate the householders by giving contamination back to them. Within two or three weeks of the system being introduced, they've got it. 
they don't want to have stuff come back to them. And a key factor to this whole process is then what do you do about residual waste? The trash can. And the, the, the key to, the, to what the Welsh Government has done and now what the Northern Irish Government is doing is encouraging squeezing effectively the residual waste. You, give, you invest your money in the best possible recycling service you can provide and then you part start cutting the money on the collection system. So in, you can use paper weight, you can go less frequently. The standard in the UK now really is a fortnightly collection of a 65 gallon, I worked that one out, <laughs> trash can. <laughs> but with, that's moving now, that's moving to three weekly collections, in one case it's a four weekly collection. Um, in Northern Ireland what they've chosen to do is actually take all those 65 gallon drums away and actually replace them with, uh, re replace them with about a 45, about a third less. And what that means is that you, you're nudging people to use the recycling system and it's not costing you on quality because you can deal with that. So the net result, when you have a look at the overall cost, that means that you're saving on landfill, you're saving on collection costs for landfill, um, and you're, you're getting nearly 100 pounds a ton for every ton of recyclables you actually collect. So, end results for us. This is what we try and sell to the public and sell to the politicians is 86% of what we collect on the system, and this is to 170,000 households, is recycled in Northern Ireland. There's three companies um, who buy this material off us. Uh, the paper goes to make egg boxes. If you look at the economic added value of paper into egg boxes, it's about 1,100 pounds a ton. And if you look at the total economic value of recycling this material into new products, it's about 100 million pounds a ton from a tiny country in Northern Ireland, which adds to the manufacturing base um, and supports about 750 jobs. So this starts to become of interest, not just to the councils, but also to government, because they're seeing it as part of an industrial strategy. Um, the public like it because they can see that we're taking responsibility and not shipping stuff out into the big unknown um, and depending on that, uh, depending on the, uh, the, the export market, which I can tell you, if, if you want to see more about why China did what they did and actually stopped taking a bit of this, there's a documentary called, it's a film actually called Plastic China. And, and it shows, so, sorry, it shows the cottage industry that was existing with people almost in slave labor conditions, the back of farms, sorting plastic, um, pelletizing plastic, cooking with the, with the remnants, and just dumping the rest onto a field and setting light to it. And it's absolutely shocking. That problem, as has been highlighted earlier, was simply just being transferred now to Indonesia, Indi India, Taiwan, Malaysia, um, Vietnam particularly. And those countries are now working together to do exactly what China did. It's because we have to wake up and we need to be looking at how we actually deal with this material at home in a serious way. So I'm just gonna finish off with progress to date for us. This is a map of Northern Ireland. Um, the, the yellow are the councils, or the parts of councils that um, are doing the box separation system. The blue are single stream commingling without class. The white, it's most of the rural areas, um, are fully commingled with glass and textiles and batteries and small wheat. And they don't understand the situation, the, 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 the change. So I'm aware of the difficulty of convincing people. But within the next two or three years, we're gonna to move to this. We're around 300,000 households on a shift across the system. And that gets really interesting then because you've got a collection system that's consistent. You can develop the economies of scale. We can start looking at, oh, we're rather than getting 50,000 tons of material that we can just about get to a point where we can sell, we hope, onto the markets. Uh, we can actually take plastics and we can start separating them into polymer types. 
we can start making quite sure that they're actually being recycled in Northern Ireland. Um, we can do the same for fibre as well. We can start separating the fibre out and getting the high value. And what that will do is it'll actually make the collection systems actually even cheaper. So this kind of virtuous circle that's there to be got if we can start thinking differently about the way we do things. So look guys, that's me. Um, I'm here because I'm curious and if anyone thinks that they're in a municipality where this could potentially work, then I want to hear from you. Thank you. Good morning, well, good afternoon everybody. Thanks so much for coming. It's actually a really big turnout today, so that's great. Um, my name is Lisa von Sturmer. I am a hauler, a small hauler, an independent hauler in Vancouver, BC. And I started my company about 10 years ago. And today I'm here to talk to you guys about starting a business that you're passionate about in environmental uh, services, or for us, waste. Are any of you guys entrepreneurs? In the room? A couple, okay, good. So you'll relate to some of the, my lessons that I've learned. Anybody who wants to start a business? No? Okay, smart. <laughs> smart because, you know, here's the real deal. Most businesses don't make it to the 10 year mark. 47% get to five years, 10% or 33% make it to 10. And uh, we're pretty lucky that in October we're going to hit that mark. Um, so what I wanted to say today is that anybody can start a business. I myself don't have a background in business. I actually started in television and editing. Uh, any MMA sports fans in the room? Anybody like, yeah, okay, UFC. So I actually worked for a show called Bodog Fight. We filmed fights all over Russia, Canada, the States. Uh, shameless name drop, that's former UFC champ Eddie Alvarez, who's a real great guy. Um, and this was my first foray in working in a world where there were not a lot of women. Uh, it was one of three women that worked on this show. Uh, loved it, had a really great time. Uh, ended up casting the ring girls and the bikini models. Most of my guy friends really wanted my job. But I wanted to do something a little bit different. I had always had a passion for the environment and I wanted to do something that was good for the earth. And as much as I loved working in fights, I wanted to do something that had more of a legacy. I felt like if I died and all I had left on my tombstone was like hired bikini models, maybe not enough. So while I was working, I got introduced to a book called The 4-Hour Workweek. And the premise of this book is that you build a business that you really love and you only work four hours a week for the rest of your life. And 10 years later, I can tell you guys that I have not succeeded in doing that. Um, so there's no check mark there. But one of the things that was really important in the book, and it was a really great lesson for me, was that you make a checklist of everything that you want your business to give you. Uh, and I had a mentor tell me once that you build your business to serve you, not the other way around. And when we're fighting fires as we do in our businesses, it's really easy to forget, why did we do this? I am, over my last 10 years, there's been many a time where I've questioned why I went into the waste industry. And having this list has been really, really important for me. Um, you know, I wanted something that was legacy. I wanted something where I could work from anywhere. And today I'm working from Vegas, which is very exciting. Uh, I wanted something where I could eventually remove myself. Working, we're working on that. Uh, and definitely I wanted something with a recurring revenue model. And if any of you guys are, are wanting to start a business, I would highly stress the importance of putting in a recurring revenue model into your business. It has saved us many, many times when there's been challenges in our local market, when I've got contracts of clients that have to keep paying me every month no matter what. Um, so find a way to put it in there if you can. And the list was also really important because I ended up starting this business with a good friend of mine and we didn't really know what business to start. And we had several really terrible ideas initially, including a dog walking business. I don't think that I would be here today if that's the one that we had gone with. So we ended up going to a small island off the coast of BC called Savory Island. And it's mandatory composting and mandatory recycling on the island. So whatever you bring on, you gotta take off. So this is like, over 10 years ago, my only experience with composting back then was a worm bin that my friend had on her balcony. The worms died. It wasn't a very efficient system. But I was really impressed when we went to the island because at the end of the week of just putting materials into the compost bin in the backyard of the house, we had almost no waste. So when we left the island, I was really impressed. 
went back to the studio where I worked, and I started feeling really guilty because tons of the material going in the office garbage was all compostable. Food waste, coffee grinds, paper plates. And I, I wanted to do something about it, but I didn't necessarily want to do it myself. Uh, so I went online, I Googled, there was nobody doing corporate organics recycling programs in the offices. And I realized that that could be an opportunity for us to do something that people wanted to do, but not themselves. So they would pay us to do it. Uh, and so that idea checked off the most boxes. And so I went into business. This is my, my friend Andrew. We were best friends in high school. Uh, best friends don't necessarily make the best business partners, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, and so we started this business with a $15,000 loan from the Canadian Youth Business Foundation. No bank would touch us. No one wanted to give us a penny. Even our parents were kind of like, what are you doing? Um, what's composting? Gross. Uh, and so we, <laughs> we made many mistakes. Number one is that we bought a Japanese right-hand drive minivan as our first fleet vehicle. And we took the seats out of the back and uh, we paid cash. We paid $7,500 cash right up front and we thought we were making a great decision. Um, obviously half of our startup capital in one vehicle is a terrible idea. And if you're starting a business, stretch out your payments. Uh, cash flow is king. And make sure you're getting the right vehicle for the job because as soon as we drove off the lot, we suddenly realized that the only way to get the material in and out of the van was uh, by hand. And you can see in the middle there, that's Andrew taking some of the bags out and taking them to the dump. We actually used to have a kiddie pool in the back of the van because as you know, organics are mostly liquid. So the weight of the bags when it compresses creates all the juice. Uh, and so it would flow all over the back of the van. So we had the, the pool in there. And we would get to the dump. We would dump out the pool. That's me scrubbing the back of the van. Um, we, we did what we could. Um, and as many of our previous panelists have talked about, sometimes your biggest problems turn out to be some of your best opportunities. Because uh, one day, a giant tree fell on our van and actually blew out all the windows. Uh, that's us driving around, that's the, the tarps blowing in the wind. And there are two benefits for this. The first was that we had a very well-established community of fruit flies that lived in the back of the van, and then the windows being gone created this current that just sucked them out, the windows out the back, which is a nice break when we were driving up front. And also because at the time, Japan had just had a tsunami and there was no way that we could import any parts for our very specific niche vehicle uh, that we had invested all our money in. So our insurance company actually wrote it off, which was a very big blessing in disguise because there was no way we were ever going to sell our van. Um, <laughs> so that was a win, even though at the time it was, it was like disaster. Um, so I would do this during the day. I would do this from usually about 7 or 8 a.m. to about 5 p.m. And then at night, I worked at a nightclub because it was the best cash per hour ratio that I could get. And I still did some editing in the evenings as well. So I would get home, have a nap, go to work at 9 p.m. and then work till about 3 or 4 in the morning. That's a Steve Aoki did a, one of our shows. And that's actually a picture of me, although it's hard to see. I kind of try to blow it up. You can kind of see a tray with some drinks and like a little arm poking up, and that's me. Um, really thinking about whether or not I was making the right decision with my life. Uh, but what I wanted to say about this, there is a point, is that when you're starting your business, you really want to make sure you've got money coming in from other places. We didn't end up paying ourselves for the first year. We didn't take salary. Obviously, we didn't really have much money to begin with anyways. But had we been depending on the business to pay ourselves, we would have been making really short-term decisions. So having that extra income, being able to pay your rent, being able to have a life outside of the company allowed us to keep reinvesting and then eventually have staff, which was great. Uh, so on the outside, everything was going really well. We actually won some awards. Um, a lot of businesses really were excited to compost. We actually did diversion reports. Our, my background in media and my partner's background in PR was great because we knew what our clients wanted. We did sustainability and diversion reports over 10 years ago, which was great. We were pretty uh, leading in what we were doing. 
but on, in the background uh, was not ideal. So like I said before, best friends in life doesn't necessarily mean best business partners at work. And uh, this is one I would recommend to you guys if you're picking partners. Number one, don't pick a partner because you're scared to start a business by yourself. You want to make sure that you're picking a partner that really adds value, but also someone that you know that you can work with. Uh, and number two, shareholders agreements are really important and you definitely want to have one created when you're starting the business and everyone's really excited and happy and there's no money involved and definitely not when you're trying to buy somebody out. This is the worst time to create a shareholders agreement and I would also highly recommend not having a 50-50 split. So if you're going to start a business, you're going to buy into a business, you're going to uh, try to get equity in a business. You don't want a 50-50 because that means no one's in charge. So at the end of the day, you always have to have one person that has the final say. You need a decision maker. It's going to avoid a lot of conflict. And I highly recommend that you make sure that you are the person that has that 51 because it's a make or break. And I think there's something else that I, if I could go back in time and talk to myself way back then that I wish I had known, it's that uh, optical success is all, I, I can't, I can't. It's bullshit. <laughs> um, and I think when we're starting out as entrepreneurs and even as we grow in our businesses and even now 10 years later, it's really easy to look outside of what other businesses are doing. Like even here at the Waste Expo, everyone's gonna be like, we bought a new truck, we got this new territory, I hired all these amazing employees, everything's fantastic. When the real truth might be that that contract's losing the money, the truck is breaking down, who knows? But we never really get to hear that side of the story. So if you're always comparing what you're doing against them, you're always gonna feel like a failure. And uh, there's a, that old saying, comparison is the thief of joy. Very, very true. Um, so I ended up buying out my friend Gained the business, lost a friend, and it was really a sad time for me. So even though it looked everything was awesome, uh, I kind of felt really dejected, and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to keep going in the business. And I would say it's really important to remember over a long period of time, just like with relationships, uh, you know, you fall in and out of love, and you gotta find ways to stay in love. So you might find yourself in kind of a doldrum or a boring spot, even in your career or at work, and you've got to do something to shake it up. You can't wait for it to change. You've got to go out and make it and find that spark and remember your passion. So my mentor was like, Lisa, you got to do something crazy. What's the craziest thing you can do? I went on the um, Canadian Shark Tank. So <laughs> Mr. Wonderful here, you might recognize Mr. Kevin O'Leary, actually got his start on our version of the show. And um, this is me showing Kevin that there's money to be found in waste, and that's Kevin's face right before he said, all right, and offered me a deal, which was really cool. <laughs> um, terrifying experience, mostly because I thought I would cry on television. I wasn't really expecting it to go very well, and um, happily enough, it did. We got chosen as the second best pitch in nine years, which was great. Very exciting opportunities to come. Uh, we got slammed, my inbox was crazy. That's like an hour of people emailing me. I forgot to take my cell phone off of certain parts of the internet and people started phoning me. I didn't know that people outside Canada really watched Dragon's Den, so I was getting phone calls from Columbia. Flattering, but I was also very overwhelmed. And I put a little chart there, the FOMO chart, so fear of missing out. Uh, and I was very much in the red zone because suddenly we had these amazing problems, like everyone wants service, people want a franchise, holy smokes, but operationally we just like couldn't deal with it. And I was feeling like this is our one chance and we are messing up, and I was really kind of stressed out about it. And the main problem that we had, and uh, some of you might relate to this, was driver turnover. We couldn't keep our guys, like we had, Call, our phone was ringing off the hook, everyone wanted service, and like I couldn't keep my people. So it's like the best problems and the shittiest problems because you're like, I finally have sales, where are you going? Um, and initially I thought it was us. You know, We had tried so many different things to get our guys involved. We had an amazing office culture, but the, the tactics we were working on, the office culture, just didn't work with our drivers. You know, they didn't want to come to office parties. They didn't want to do like fun little activities and culture building stuff. They wanted to get in the truck and go. Um, 
And so initially I was like, this is me and my office background and my previous experience getting in the way. So I started reaching out to other business owners, other people that had fleets, um, even our competitors. I think that's a cool thing about the waste industry is that we compete and we collaborate. It's kind of unique. And I was actually really surprised that it was a very universal challenge. A lot of people were having the same issues with their guys. This is actually a stat from 2018, and you can see, like, I mean, that's over some of almost 100% turnover for, for the American Trucking Association. So, um, and it was like a really expensive time for us. It was really challenging. But like I said before, sometimes those biggest problems secretly are your, your greatest opportunity. Because what we ended up doing was we built out these driver incentive bonus programs. And we already had a, a very significant data tracking system in place. I'm a data nerd, I track absolutely everything. Um, and it actually turned out to be something that was really valuable. So we have automated reports that are generated monthly, quarterly, and annually. And we have a benchmark that we have for the drivers. We identified what can drivers do that make us money, and what can drivers do that make clients happy. And then we put a grade next to it and a dollar next to it. And so now, every time we have a, we do monthly meetings with our guys, we call them one-on-ones, we give them their report, it's got all their metrics there and then their daily data, and suddenly the guys are collaborating with us to improve their performance, which was like a complete change. Before it was always very kind of a us versus them, don't tell me what to do, and in this situation it's like, pay yourself, you decide, how, how do you want to work? And the behavior change we saw was actually even, I was surprised, we gave out the first report card. One guy had a, a scanning score of 8%, and he was like, why is my score so low? I was like, you're not scanning. We'd been asking guys to scan, begging them, doing everything. Literally, the next month, he was like way up, and he was getting mad at us, because he's like, this scan, this QR isn't in the right spot. You guys need to get QRs here, here, and here. Suddenly, he was chasing us to make sure that we had everything in place, because he's like, I want my bonus. Um, which was great. I was like, this is ideal, it's what we want. Uh, and it was really unexpected. So that disaster of having all these dream wannabe clients that we f couldn't get because the guys just weren't there turned into something that was really cool. And this reporting system actually had a huge impact on our, our bottom line, essentially. This is 18 months of data that we just compiled and obviously we don't have a ton of time, so I won't go too much into it. But just by showing the guys the numbers, we were able to decrease our service times by 45%, which for us is huge. Like we weren't begging, we weren't angry, we weren't anything. They did it themselves. We just showed them the, the information. Um, and the other cool thing that came from that is all of the other companies I was reaching out to and trying to get feedback and advice from, now they want to use it, which is great. So we are going to be beta testing this with some of our other, um, I say competitors, but collaborators in the fall. Um, and it's a whole new revenue stream for us, and it's a really exciting opportunity. So the past 10 years for me, where are we now? We finally closed our first municipal RFP, which was like a really big win for us. Obviously, our trucks have gotten a little different since our initial minivan. <laughs> um, and I mean, and I can drive that too, but I prefer not to anymore. And I think for me, what I've found in this industry is that I feel like I'm just getting started. Waste, I knew nothing about it when I, when I was first starting my company. And the more I learn, the more opportunity I see, the more exciting I think it is on a personal level. You know, we've diverted millions and millions of pounds from the environment and millions and millions of pounds of CO2. And that's something that I can feel good about every single day. And I, and I love sharing it with our clients. I love sharing it with our staff. So I would say to you guys two things. One, trust the timing of your life. Sounds trite, but it's true. I thought that I would be here where I am today after like two years. You know, I expected that we would be there like that. It took me 10. It felt like a long time, but I don't think that we would have learned or done the things that we had if we hadn't had those challenges. It made me a better entrepreneur. It made us a more resilient business. And if any of you guys are thinking about starting businesses, I mean, now is always the best time. And then the second final thing is a quote that I love that I think applies very much to our industry, which is that uh, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. And I think that we know that very well. We're used to getting our hands dirty. We go out there and we make things happen. 
experience. And I think particularly now too with all the regulation changes that are coming through in our industry, it's a great time to be an independent hauler. You know, we can be nimble, we can be responsive, we can find opportunities, we can be innovative, uh, and we can do things a lot faster than some of the big guys can. So all of the challenges that are happening really are creating new avenues for us to add revenue streams or be increase efficiencies and be more effective recyclers. So I wish you guys all the best. If you have any questions about anything, I'd love to share any stories about MMA in Russia or whatever. Come find me. Thank you. Thomas Edison. Um, let's see, how do we do this? Okay, um, we're out of time. Um, and, and I was sort of thinking about this as I was getting up here, and I know many of you have some place you need to go. If you do, um, you won't offend me. Um, but I do, have, I do have about 15 minutes of things that I'm gonna talk about, and if you bear with me, that would be great. Um, but I wanted to give you a chance to, to, to jump off. So I'm going to uh, thank you, first of all, for, for sticking it out. Um, I'm J.D. Lindenberg, as, they, as, they, as, as I was introduced. I'm um, taking a little bit of a different tack here today, and I'm going to talk about the circumstances we find ourselves in, talk about some of the challenges, and then talk about some of the big reasons that we want to be in this business of recycling and recovery. So I really liked the last story. Thank you, that was, that was, that was exciting, it was entrepreneurial. Um, I've been in your situation, struggling for two years, and realizing it was 10, and things like that. So we find ourselves in a situation where the markets are in the toilet. Everybody's frustrated with the recycling, we're wondering what the future is. And just to give that a little context, I want to point out that this was highly predictable. Mid-1990s, a bunch of development loans were put in place um, with China by the International Development Loan Authorities. And in those, in those loan terms were, um, uh, were requirements that by the end of the terms, um, environmental laws would get enforced. Air, water, and in this case, solid waste. And so the result of that, obviously, was Green Fence and National Sword, and the circumstances we find ourselves in today. And it's been hard in the industry, but I think in some ways it's good for all of us because it's challenged us to deal with the fact that we can no longer ship lots and lots of materials to China that is just barely not waste. And instead, um, focus on internal markets, focus on some of the things that the other speakers have been talking about. So, you know, what I'm happy to say is recycling is still alive and well. Northern, you know, upper peninsula of Michigan, a place with not a lot of people, 40% of the land mass of Michigan, is one of my clients is proceeding with developing the single stream capacity to take over from their current dual stream that's not working so well. And they did this based on the fact that they polled their, they polled their residents, they asked them, what do you want to do? And they found overwhelming support for moving ahead and making a really substantial investment. And I found that really exciting. I found it exciting to work with these folks and, and, and recognizing that they're responding to the, the, the desires of their constituents. They're gonna have a really top-notch facility when it's all done. They're gonna be the regional MRF provider for that, for that community up there. It's a very large chunk of, chunk of land, not a lot of population, and they will be serving the private sector, the public sector, people on all sides 100 miles away. So it'll be a great story. And it's part of the transition that we've seen. We've part of the transition we've seen from the mid-90s, starting with single stream development, till now it's the dominant paradigm. And I think there's some misconceptions, because a lot of times single stream gets blamed for the problems in the marketplace. And I don't think that that's fair, because I think one of the motivations that people need to recognize is that the big driver on single stream collection was actually in the collection infrastructure. And we've made these investments in the curb carts and the automated collection. And from my perspective, it's essential for all of us to remember that many of these decisions were made from a safety perspective. And that by, by asking people to get out on the streets, do repetitive lifting, and even worse, impatient drivers running them over, is a real problem. And by keeping people in the truck, 
we have a much, much safer industry. And so I don't see this dog walking backwards. There might not be a lot of dual stream programs transitioning to single stream today, but I don't see <coughs> retrenchment from single stream back to dual stream. I don't think that's happening. But it does bring with it some problems. We all know about the contamination problems. They're there, they're real, they're ugly. <sighs> that previous slide looks a lot like garbage, doesn't it? And it shouldn't, and it doesn't have to. Because we know that even though national averages of contamination and residue rates at MRFs can be up in excess of 20%, that there's plenty of programs where it's under 10%. Somewhere in the room here. And uh, to, to, to reference an earlier speaker, some of the best demonstration programs being run are being run by not-for-profit organizations who are focusing on that level of recovery and focus and markets. They aren't doing what we tried to do for 10 years, which is taking that relatively crappy material, putting it on a truck, sending it to harbor, sending it to the modern MRF that you see in China. Not. Not a good situation. Nobody's proud of that. I think it's good that we're not doing that anymore. I'm sad to hear that some of these materials are ending up in villages in Indonesia, but I hope to hell that's stopping. Because instead, we need to focus on a high quality product with regional markets. Now I recognize that this is the heartland, this is the, the middle America. But that represents, the density of dots represents real markets for real material for recyclable markets in the upper Midwest. Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana, Ohio, Ontario, so on and so forth. So don't let people tell you there aren't markets for plastics, for metal, for glass, for crying out loud. They're there. It's important that we recognize that. They're dynamic, but they need to have high enough quality material. So we have an industrial system that's highly dependent on recycled material. 65% of all paper mills take some kind of recycled furnish. In excess of 50%, a lot of the fiber made today is recycled furnish itself. 80 million out of 95 million tons of, of steel being made is coming from recycled product. We're not so good on plastic. We talked about that from some other the folks here. We're not so good on plastic. We need to do better. But some of this is in relation also to the evolving ton, the changes that we see in the marketplace, the fact that the paperless society has started to hit us. We don't read newspapers in this fashion anymore. We read them on these, these smartphone things. We ship cardboard boxes to my home and yours through Amazon. It's not ending up in the back of the mall anymore as much as it used to. Proliferation of plastic packaging. But the key to this, and the key to the quality marketplace, is the educational message. And so I'd argue that those programs that are doing a good job of keeping contamination down are investing in that education. And this is from my friends at the Recycling Partnership, their sort of roadmap to success in education. And it's sort of interesting about what you don't see here. What you don't see here is an emphasis on social media. You see an emphasis on the hard, in the trenches, face to face, putting mailers in people's boxes, putting up billboards, doing it in multiple languages that is the heavy lifting of education. And I personally believe there's a cost curve of cost benefit on this that I'm hoping to work with uh, Recycling Partnership to define because I think that that leverage is going to be many multiples. Take it to a bigger picture. Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this, in my view. The reason I'm working in this is that it boils down to dealing with climate change. Recycling is climate change mitigation. And we're gonna be hearing a lot about mitigation. We're gonna be hearing a lot about adaptation. But this is the way we participate it when we're doing what we do. Because essentially the story about climate change and global climate change gases is about energy use. And the reason to recycle makes us feel good, it's part of the economy, but the fact of the matter is it saves energy. The embodied energy of recycled feedstocks is higher than virgin feedstock. 
and we can keep that energy. And yes, there's LCA arguments that get very technical, system boundaries get drawn in different ways, and people argue that certain materials should or shouldn't be in this mix of materials for recycling. But I'd argue that we need a consistent number of materials across all the states that we commonly recycle in common ways and that we stop arguing about this and we stop trying to focus down onto four materials because that's not going to get us to where we need to go for that big picture part, which is climate change. And I'd argue that collectively, not just the people in this room, but the population in the whole believes in that, even though our political leaders don't. But even that is changing. It's changing because of leadership of people like Catherine Hayhoe, a well-known climate, climate scientist, directs Texas Tech climate scientist, who have a climate center for climate, that also happens to be an evangelical Christian. And for those of you who know me, you know I'm not a terribly spiritual religious person, but I have a great deal of respect for people like Catherine who get out there and talk about the social components of this discussion across the spectrum of political beliefs. And that is the kind of thing that gives me a great deal of hope about trying to deal with some of the issues around climate change that are really significant. It's something that my generation, I think, has bequeathed on the younger generations to you, and I don't feel very good about that. But I have lived through four waves of environmentalism. I remember Love Canal and Rachel Carson because it was a big deal for my parents and we talked about it when I was a kid. I remember the energy shocks and embargoes in the 1970s, and gas lines, and the emergence of people like Amory Lovins and talking about megawatts and thinking about energy differently than just nuclear power and oil. And I remember the close the loop, garbage barge days of Bill McDonough. And I think we're living in another time, another time of a similar movement built around the Green New Deal that has stimulated conversations across the political spectrum, even on Fox News. Even if it's negative, it's being talked about. And I think that's a good thing. And like others before me, there's also a recognition among the brands that there's a, really poten there's a real potential problem. Because their social license to operate is at risk. What is the social license to operate? The license to operate is having enough trust from their customers that they will continue to buy product from them. And that's a very dangerous thing. If you lose that, you lose your marketplace. And for the case of these large companies, the ones who support closed loop fund who've decided that they want to invest in the recycling infrastructure because it's important to them, if they feel like if they lose that license to operate, their value of their company will plummet. You see it very specifically in things like Amazon Prime. Look at that. Just last week, my family is an Amazon Prime abuser. <laughs> and we get lots of packages that look about the size of the one on the left. But isn't it cool that there's now an option? Let me see if I can use this. Frustration-free packaging that they're putting out there for equal price. That's a license to operate issue. Because in the end, this is an opportunity for all of us to participate in something concrete that allows us to deal with the very big systemic worldwide problem and try to help avoid these things so that we can stick with a really beautiful planet and not trash it and provide that opportunity for subsequent generations to live on that planet and be happy there. So thank you very much.